Hello, welcome to the Transgender Film Center's conversation with the creative minds behind Framing Agnes. We want to thank Mama Film for including us in their satellite screens programming at the 2022 Sundance Film Festival. My name is Sav Rogers and I'm the founder of the Transgender Film Center, a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to helping trans made films connect with audiences around the world. I'm so pleased to moderate this conversation today with the brilliant people behind Framing Agnes, a Sundance 2022 official selection. In case you're unfamiliar with the premise behind this innovative movie, here's the logline. After discovering case files from a 1950s gender clinic, a cast of trans actors turn a talk show inside out to confront the legacy of a young trans woman forced to choose between honesty and access. So please welcome our panelists today, Chase Joint, director writer, Jen Richards, who plays Barbara, Jules Gill Peterson, co-executive producer, Morgan M. Page, writer, executive producer. So glad to have you here, everybody. Thank you. I hadn't heard that line yet, having to choose between honesty and access. I like that. That's a good, good log line. Uh, pulled right from the website. So whoever the copy editor was on that, kudos <laughs> to you. Uh, <laughs> so just a general question to start this. Uh, how did you all get involved with Framing Agnes? Uh, Chase, I'd love to start with you and, and to talk about the inception of this project. Uh, absolutely. So I started thinking about Agnes as early as 2014 and through a series of very fortunate events, Kristen and I landed in the private archival holdings that eventually revealed the case studies to us in 2017. And it was upon witnessing those words and having those feelings that I immediately thought, there's a, a moving image project here. Like this is, this is a world and a kind of exploration and a set of questions that needs to exist beyond the page. We shot a short version of the film that premiered in 2019 and it's been a race since then. Morgan, how about you? How did you get involved? Um, yeah, so Chase and I have been kind of around each other in artistic and community spaces for the better part of a decade, just like appreciating each other's work from afar. Um, <laughs> and uh, after the short came out, Chase approached me about um, collaborating on the screenplay for the feature. Um, I think because of my work with Once in the Vaults, which is the podcast that brings you all the dirt gossip and glamour from trans history, kind of my whole vibe is taking things out of the archive and um, making them exciting and alive for the people um, that they relate to. And yeah, so Chase and I started working together, which was an interesting um collaborative process that hasn't stopped since, not just with this project, but with the whole kind of world we've built um, in Chase's like friendship bracelet approach to life. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's me. I guess I'll pass it to Jules maybe. Sure, well, I, you know, I, I'm one of the sort of later arrivals to this project and, you know, like, like everyone else, I think just like deep artistic intellectual crushes on everyone in proximity to this project. And of course, you know, in my day job as, as, a, as a historian, I'd known about Agnes for a long time, but um, you know, and I, I'd seen the short and absolutely just thought it was groundbreaking and exciting and, you know, kind of just been on my mind and, and Chase and I started having conversations actually without an explicit agenda. I'm right around the beginning of the pandemic. So sort of taking advantage of the strange situation of everything being suspended. And um, even though we didn't have a plan at the beginning, it just kind of snowballed really fast. Um, not, not so much because of those usual sorts of subject area expertise, like, you know, I'm down to, to nerd out as, as intensely as anyone. But um, I think it was more like, I, you know, already, this kind of incredible collaborative project was seeping through so clearly and it, I kind of felt it in my bones. So um, when, when Chase invited me to get more involved, I was just like, yeah, sign me up, enlist me, totally down. Um, and so it's been really exciting to kind of plug into this really far flung, well-developed, super thoughtful, cohesive team. And Jen, how about you? It's just occurring to me now, Chase, was this just your way of hanging out with a bunch of hot trans women? Because there, there are a lot in this project and now I'm beginning to wonder. <laughs> My deep geeky archival research has arrived me here. <laughs> Where I just have to work with all these beautiful trans women. <laughs> Favorite people in the world. 
<laughs> it goes both ways. Uh, yeah, I was uh, I was one of the early witnesses to Chase's work when he was at University of Chicago and saw some of the first um, inclinations in, in this direction and have been intrigued and engaged uh, from the start. And um, anytime one of my trans friends trans friends ask if I want to do something with them. I just, I say yes. So <laughs> and I've been thrilled to be part of this. I didn't get to be part of the short because I was, um, I wasn't available when they were filming it. So I was particularly happy when it came back around in a fuller form and I could participate. Well, let's take and it elevate back to the, the project properly. <laughs> well, let's take it back to the short film. Chase, you know, you made this short film to great acclaim. Um, you know, you won some awards. It had a nice premiere at Tribeca. Um, it's 19 minutes, right? And so then you expanded into a feature film. You know, what, what about that process left you wanting more and made you feel like there was more story to tell? Oh, the answer to that is long and I'll just pick some highlights. The first of which is that we shot the short on favors from friends and credit card debt and a little bit of grant money in one room in maybe two days, three days, um, we were limited structurally. And I don't think that at all discredits the extraordinary performances and world that arrives on screen. But as a maker, I understood that with some more time and some more resources, there were further ways in which we could build out the potentials of the story and the complexity of the story that we were trying to engage. And, you know, there's a really interesting turn in the time period between when the short arrived in public and now that we're arriving here in the feature, which is to say, I think, you know, shooting in a pre-2019 world, there was a reliance upon self-narration and coming of age and a recognition of transition broadly conceived as being important building blocks to a story about trans history. And I think that what we've arrived to together in this feature is a refusal of that tendency in service of a set of alternative questions that open up when you say no to the common ways in which trans people get articulated for mainstream forward-facing publics. It's one of the things that I love so much about uh, the feature is the fact that you, you do kind of refuse to engage in how trans stories have been traditionally presented and you subvert them in this great way. You know, a big theme of the movie really seems to be uh, you know, the, the balance of visibility versus invisibility and maybe some of the, the privilege, I guess, that comes with being able to be invisible, right? I think this is a topic that's discussed kind of at length in the movie and is, you know, a lot, many scenes are about it, if not all of them. Um, and this is kind of an open question for the panel. You know, there's a lot of visibility for trans people without much in the way of protection, if any. Um, how do, how do we reconcile that? And I guess, like, what can we learn from the characters in Framing Agnes moving forward? I, I could kick us off and say that I think that, that the characters in this film are here to give us a master class in the, in the pitfalls and allures of visibility and to give us an education that we as a culture have been sorely lacking and, and one that says enough with these narratives we've been sold about, you know, the virtue of representation and the progress that will be attached to it. But so too, the kind of tired refrain of being like, well, actually, visibility has been really devastating for a lot of trans people. And that's true. But I think it's time to stretch the collective imagination and actually demand more of people in making sense of this concept, right? And so I think one of the things that's interesting in the film is that we see so many different versions of some people being visible, some people being invisible. But then we ask those questions about who's not in the film, who's not on screen, what came from the archive, what can't be recuperated, what we're able to show, what we're able to discuss. And we also talk about what we want out of visibility. What do we want <laughs> when we go to the movies? What do we want when we see trans people on screen, right? And I think that you know, to my mind, part of what we're, we're sort of getting, you know, where we're getting in this film, I think, is a kind of 
gosh, for me at least, this kind of like powerful exhale of saying, okay, enough of that tired paradigm <laughs> where you're either on screen or off screen. Can we acknowledge that real in real life, you come on and off all the time, you're invisible sometimes, you're visible other times, and that things don't neatly line up that way. And so in some ways, I think it's sort of a, a, a thesis of messiness, but, but one that I think you're really not just shown, I think you actually have to kind of like get sucked in to the to the matrix of it all and and get sort of like put around in the spin cycle I'm not sure why my laundry metaphor is coming up here but um you know there's something there's something kind of jostling um I think certainly probably for all of us you know who have taken part in the project who've been on screen but I think it's going to be very jostling for the audience as well I think people are going to feel like ah I can't pigeonhole this moment I, I'm everything I've you know seen on TV or on films not helping me understand this moment I'm a little scared but then but then, you know, there's going to be this kind of like moment that comes after that. So I, I think it's kind of a big deal. I think we're kind of announcing, you know, the end of a certain era of trans visibility um, as business as usual. And I think, you know, when I think about visibility in this film, one of the things that I think we're doing that's really challenging is actually shifting away the idea of trans people being visible or invisible and pulling back the frame to see, to make visible the people who are constructing where and when trans people can be visible. Um, whether that be uh, Garfinkel, from the psychologist whose um, archive we've pulled from, uh, or talk show hosts, or all sorts of people who uh, generally cis people who get to decide when we are visible and when we are not visible and what happens to us when we're in or out of frame. We're moving back and we're really implicating um, the whole apparatus surrounding trans people, not just in media, but in every uh, interaction we have in our lives, whether it be through kind of medical institutions, um, policing, uh, or you know, just being out and about in the world as a person. So yeah, I think our film is really trying to trouble in every way the notion of visibility and trans people. I wanna yes and everything Morgan and, and Jules said, uh, and, and also had something that intrigues me about this film, particularly in contrast to Disclosure, which was a Sundance from, from two years ago, which is also about you know, trans people uh, invisibility, is that this film feels more like it's made for trans people. And of course it, it's not just for that audience, but it feels particularly legible for trans people uh, because of the number of trans narratives and because the way it gets to, you know, when we talk about visibility, we, we tend to kind of like on some level mean for the rest of the world, but there's also the visibility to ourselves. Um, when Jules in the film talks about having been kind of an expert on trans children, which is often seen as a new phenomenon in our contemporary culture, and then realizing that, you know, here was this uh, trans boy in, you know, in, in that time period. And so making our own history legible to us, and then also looking back and seeing different uh, different approaches to transness. I love the contrast between um, Agnes feeling so isolated and then Barbara just being like, bitch, no, <laughs> like there's plenty of us all around. And, and, and it just gives us more of a sense of like, oh, wow, we really are part of this larger culture, both in terms of, of the number of people and then also temporally, the way that it stretches back through time. And that gives me a sense of, of place. Uh, and, and that's really important too. It's a, something I can draw strength from. Beautiful answers all around. Uh, Jen, you, you speak of Barbara. This is not a traditional acting role. Um, you know, this is very much, uh, you're approaching this hybrid documentary where you are being yourself and you are also portraying Barbara. And so how did you prepare to, to be in Framing Agnes and, and inhabit that character? Uh, for Barbara, in particular playing a trans one of that time period, I had a slight advantage in that I had already done two other um, pieces that were from similar time periods, a, a, a feature film uh, with a trans woman in, I think, the mid-60s, and then in uh, Tales of the City uh, on Netflix, which is also a trans woman um, in the late 60s. And 
so it's a time period that that feels um, familiar to me. There's something also about the the kind of uprightness and formality of women from that time period that's very accessible to me as a you know southern waspy woman, <laughs> like in a family full of like really strong, proper, formal women. Uh, I know that world. I I know those women, uh, and so it's it's just accessible to me in a way that I really enjoy. Uh, and then uh, Chase and the rest of the gang provided a lot of uh, great clips for us to look at just to get some of those intonations down, um, because that's really, I mean, the physicality is one thing that's probably the easiest to access, but uh, the manner of speaking um, was quite different there. That almost like there's a, a kind of thoughtfulness where like today I, I kind of think out loud and the thoughts and the words are like there's not much distance between them with Barbara, with Agnes, with a lot of the subjects. And, and people of that time period, it kind of feels like the whole thought is there in the brain before the mouth opens, like it's it's already complete. Uh, so it was really fun just to kind of explore those differences, but then also at the same time collapse the differences between the actor and the performance because of the nature of the way that this film was done and having those interwoven, whereas like in a, like when I play in a magical in Tales of City, I'm trying, like, I'm trying to disappear from the screen, you know, as Jen Richards, even though my own experiences are what allow me to create, you know, depth and nuance in the character, this film kind of collapses those. And then you start to question, like, where is the difference? Um, and it just kind of opens up a whole host of other really intriguing issues. Well, and while we're on the topic of Barbara, you know, uh, one of my favorite moments in the film, I think, is one of the funnier ones where uh, you're talking about how Barbara is being very condescending towards uh, Garfinkel in some of these transcripts. Were there any moments left on the cutting room floor of like, you know, funny moments with her? And anybody, feel free to answer this, but are there any favorite bits that, that didn't make it in the final film, but you were like, ah, that was great? I think Chase and Morgan are probably better prepped to answer that. You know, um, one of the things that there just is never enough time to capture is how brilliant Jen is. Like literally there is not one thing she said when we were recording the documentary portions of the film that we didn't want to include, but obviously there are time constraints. Um, the question was about just, Barbara, not me. <laughs> I know, but I'm just talking about you. Let me talk about you. <laughs> But it's very true. Like, even while we were on set, we were talking about it because it's just endless. Like, there's not a missed beat ever. Um, one of these days, I'm going to catch her off guard somehow. Um, but I have yet to see the mask slip. Um. <laughs> well, can I just yeah, it's that? Like, I <laughs> go ahead. Kate. Go, Jules, go. Well, I was just going to say, you know, like, one of the things that I think is so striking about Barbara and, you know, I, and to my mind, I mean, this is why, you know, Barbara and Jen go together so well, because I love how everyone actually does have multiple roles in the film, right? You know, I, I might be the only one sort of showing up as myself, but, you know, for me as someone who, you know, works as a historian during the day, I was like, well, it's my moment on screen. Like what, you know, what doll doesn't dream of that? But in return, right? It's like, Barbara and Jen have their moments as, well, certainly Jen has her moments as like historian and cultural critic, you know, and, and some of that has to do with inhabiting Barbara and then, you know, pulling, pulling back for a second to dialogue with, with Chase or with someone else. But one of the things I think is so incredible in Barbara's performance too, is you're talking about that formality, you know, the, 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 the posture, the polishedness, but there's such a quick witted pleasure to how Barbara interacts with Mike Wallace on the talk show and by extension with Garfinkel and all these other men, she's taking a kind of winking pleasure that we as the audience, you know, are getting, you know, and is a way in which she's letting us know like, oh, okay, well, here I am, I'm playing a game. Let me run circles around these, you know, idiot professors, right? I actually think there's something so important about seeing that, right? Um, whether or not any of us feel that way in our experiences with, you know, people in positions of power like that or not, there's something just so knowing about that. And the way that Barbara then is also this character who shows us how networked and well-connected trans people were in this era where we might imagine they were lonely or isolated, right? Or didn't know each other and didn't know what to make of themselves right? There's something there, right? In the little small gesture, there's an entire world of implication, like, oh, to the, you know, to the viewer, you don't even know the half of it, right? And I think that's like a really powerful form of reclamation. I also think, 
that that's absolutely true, right? No matter how far and deep we go in this research and how far and deep we go in this film, we're not even scratching the surface. And that's a good thing because I think, you know, especially for us as trans folks, as trans viewers, we get to walk away feeling a little bit of that wink and a little bit of that smile. So, you know, thank you, Jen, for making it so infectious. And just like, I don't know, I feel like I've been wearing like, you know, a little bit of um, Barbara's halo ever since I saw the first footage of your performance. Oh, I just love these answers so much. And, you know, in thinking about your question, Sab, the one thing I will say is we used as much of the archival performance as we had access to. And the cutting room floor, the things that did not make it were often some more of those outtakes and some more of the, the, the quote behind the scenes, of course, acknowledging explicitly that there is never a behind the scenes in the structure of our film, that everyone always understood the multiple recording technologies that were taking place. And so, I'm remembering a, a moment on the talk show set where Jen stopped and said, wait a second, how are we doing this? And we both looked down at our script and charted our course together. And I think the question was something like, am I talking to you like you're a talk show host or am I talking to you like you're a doctor? Because that to me pivots and changes my performance based on who I imagine to be encountering what I am saying. Am I playing for an audience? Am I playing for something that I imagine to be much more private? And and it didn't make it into the film because in some ways it was one of those moments where I hoped the work of the film would help you to figure that out along the way. We didn't need Jen's incisive question to motivate us there. We hope that as a whole, we can be troubling that line together throughout the entirety of the work. And really, you know, there's, an, there's another version of this film, which is, you know, hot takes and behind the scene laughs between cast members and between crew, because it was a really vibrant, alive, ever-shifting environment and one that was always unpredictable and always a joy. Chase, for you, you know, you, you have some incredible films under your belt, including the, the framing Agnes Short, but also No Ordinary Man. You, you know, what were you able to take away from those experiences that really informed how you wanted to do the framing Agnes feature? You know, I'm so grateful for my collaboration on No Ordinary Man, in part because it opened up access to the structures and scaffolding of a much bigger project. It offered a much larger foundation upon which to, to play and ask these questions. And it is another rousing endorsement for the cohort doc as the future of trans cinemas. I really feel tired of the hero story and uninterested in films that consolidate around one particular person, trans or otherwise, because I think that there's such exciting political work to be done when we're always juxtaposing our experiences across and alongside another and by taking seriously that films can be more than their parts and therefore we need to think about who's on screen, why, and what are the experiments and risks that we're going to take. And I just think collaboration is the future. And I think it is the most enduring and exciting way to be trying to look at history, but also looking at history, imagining where we are in the present and, and hoping for a different kind of future. Well, let's talk about collaboration. Morgan, you know, this is a very challenging hybrid documentary. Um, and writing a movie like this is, is especially challenging. So what is your process writing a movie? Like, what was your process on this like? And, and how do you like to collaborate with other people? I mean, my collaboration with Chase is just such like a huge blessing in every way. And I think I really, as I said at the beginning, I think it's based on the fact that we knew each other for so long. We respected each other's work and really understood each other's work for a really long time. So like, I know when I look on the page, what Chase is gonna be interested in. Um, and now also having written a book with him, I know how he's gonna phrase things. Uh, <laughs> and I think he, he understands me in the same way. So it was really um, surprisingly easy. Like we literally show up on the page together and we write like word by word together, um, which I'm not sure I could do with just anyone. Um, but the nature of this particular film, and Chase can also talk to this, I'm sure, but it's not like we sat down and just wrote like a script from start to finish, although we did have one at one point. Um, <laughs> and, and we had many, many different kind of like weird documents um, uh, with not so politically correct names for a little while. <laughs> 
Um, but anyway, like uh, a lot of the process has just been ongoing. It never, we didn't finish writing the film until the end of the edit. We were constantly coming back and having conversations, even down to, you know, when we saw, when Chase showed me the rough cut of the film and I came back being like, oh, I think we need to talk. <laughs> I think I was like the meanest response. <laughs> but that's what, um, you know, thankfully we have a certain level of trust that we can have those uh, difficult conversations and use it to make the work better. But yeah, like literally, I feel like we didn't finish writing this film until, I don't know, December, <laughs> January. <laughs> yeah, and if I can jump in too, I think yeah. it's true that the writing never ended and there was a way in which I was constantly shifting cuts to Jules and Morgan in particular, as we were trying to figure out how to harness the language of the talk show in service of our Mm, pursuits and it's a very hard line and one of the things that's really interesting to me is that in some ways I'm looking at this extraordinary zoom and every single person on this zoom has said no in very strategic ways to me over the course of this project everyone has been like that is not the right idea or you are not heading in the right direction and you need to rethink who you are and I'm, I wish I hope that there's a panel version of this performance so that you can see the laughter that's happening as I'm saying this because it's just true and and this is the other very necessary thing to talk about when you talk about collaboration. It's all well and good to be like, we have a collaborative process. It's beautiful and we love each other. But also it means making yourself available and really like rigorously trying to hold yourself to account when you are making choices that have consequences for those who are speaking, those who arrive on screen, those who are taking embodied risks in pursuit of what, when summarized, you know, with less precision, seems like an experimental, strange, and somewhat untrustworthy method <laughs> to show up and imagine that anything that happens that's gonna be recorded might arrive on screen. I can absolutely recognize all of the ways in which that is a very stressful situation. And so the writing had to be continued. And I also wanna flag that I think the writing is not over. We have now produced an object that will live on a screen and the writing continues now in the context of this kind of articulation and activation. I do just want to throw out real quickly a little bit of um, credit that Chase deserves for cultivating both relationships within the community and then also an environment, you know, both on set and around the creation of this film where people felt comfortable telling him no, where we, he had built up the trust and faith that this was ultimately about doing um, a project that was uh, you know, meaningful, that was resonant, that went as, uh, as far as it should go, that, um, it, you know, we never allowed him to stop short, but we also trusted it was because he wanted to go further as well. Uh, and that's not something that I would assume of every filmmaker. Uh, quite often, filmmakers do have a kind of auteur mindset where it's like, this is my view of the world, and you either support me or, or get out of the way. Uh, and Chase made himself open to that kind of feedback uh, from the beginning and empowered all of us to, to, to kind of co-author with him, which is ultimately the, the best way to be a leader. That's beautiful. What I wouldn't have given to be a fly on the wall for this process. I mean, it just seemed like a, a really terrific experience from beginning to end, at the very least something really innovative. Um, Jules, I know the film is called Framing Agnes, but I think that there's a real argument to be made that you are the main character <laughs> of this movie as you are the only talking head interview. And we end the movie with you uh, reflecting on your journey and, and how you see the future. Um, talk about that process a little bit. And, and were you aware of how big your role in the movie would come to be? Blissfully, no, because I don't know that I would have, you know, been able to say yes if I had envisioned, you know, such a, such a, a through line, right? I mean, I, I do think this collaborative team aspect is the key to understanding the whole thing, though. And for me, you know, there was a, there was an instant draw um, because, you know, my experience in the public work that I do, which is, you know, a lot more boring in most cases. It's giving lectures or writing articles or, you know, commenting on politics and media and culture has been a difficult one <laughs> for me to inhabit and one in which I've, I frequently sort of felt burned by representation and burned by platforms. And by that, I mean, 
you know, so often I come in with an agenda that is very explicitly pro-trans or anti-racist, you know, in, in a for affirmation of trans youth or something like that. Things that I know are controversial, but I've watched how easy it is for the own words that you're speaking out of your mouth to be taken away from you and to lose control over your own image and your own voice in public. And I think that that's something that a lot of trans people can relate to, especially trans women, especially trans women of color. Um, but it's something that gives me a lot of pause. And so, you know, lately in my career, I've started to become very hesitant about saying yes to things, um, even well-meaning things, you know, from, from people I know. Or, um, and so one of the things that really appealed to me about this opportunity was that we were breaking down the traditional documentary talking head format, right? I've been interviewed before for films where, of course, you know, it's fun. You sit down, I tell you what I know. I've done all the research. It's great. But the role of the filmmaker there is in some ways to insulate me as much as possible from becoming implicated in the form because it's understood that, well, you know, I'm not a filmmaker. I'm not normally on screen. Those aren't things that I want to think about. But in this case, the invitation was to step in as me. And I think one of the most remarkable moments for me personally in the film is, you know, what is, is, is a scene where we're sitting outside the library at UCLA, you know, where a lot of this kind of went down, you know, in the 1950s. And and, you know, I've been there so many times on my own doing research, right? There's never been, a, you know, a, a, a camera crew following me around, but I was sitting there talking with Chase and, you know, and, and we had this really interesting conversation just about how it felt for me to try and ask the question, like, do I ever walk in there as me? Do I ever even feel comfortable in my professional role? And then like, how am I gonna feel comfortable saying that on camera, right? And, and how do, why would I wanna say that to a whole bunch of people who are gonna be watching this film? And so there was something really transformative about it for me. And in that sense, I think I feel ki deep kinship with all the other people in the film, right? You know, sure, I've had some, you know, 21st century version of some of the things that some of our characters have gone through. But more than that, I just feel like I understand the thing that they're up to. I get, you know, the game, right? I've been in it. I I felt it in my bones. And in that sense, like for me, it came from a real place of wanting to honor that and speak to that, but also just the thrill of, of being able to, um, to embody myself for once, I guess, you know, I think that it's maybe not surprising to say that professors are sort of encouraged to distance themselves from their work. It's, you know, a way that you become an expert. And, you know, that's something I'm interested in breaking down, but I actually never thought in my entire career that I would be invited to, to just like be myself and to do my work and be in concert with all these other incredible, you know, trans geniuses who I admire and respect. So, you know, for me, it's just been one of the most gratifying experiences I've ever had. Um, and, you know, I hope that, I hope that ultimately, you know, for viewers that they feel a sense of, you know, trust and interest, but you know, not blind trust in me as a narrator um, or as someone who's, you know, I'm extending my hand and I'm saying, take it and walk with me. Um, but it's not because I know all the truths of the universe. And even if I did, I wouldn't share them all with you. Um, it's because I want to do something else. I want people to walk with me in a different way. And I think that's something that I'm doing also with every single other person on screen. Beautiful. Chase Morgan, uh, do you have any additional insight in the choice to make Jewel such a central character in the film? I mean, asked and answered in this panel, is it not? It's an extraordinary privilege to talk to Jules. And one of the things that I think is so exciting about our early conversations before we imagined a world of bringing Jules on screen was that I think we, from the first time we met at a strange cocktail bar at an academic conference, recognize that we were obsessed with the same questions and and we're troubling over some of the same questions and that for me is such an exciting foundation upon which to build a friendship uh, upon which to build work it's reflected in for example the the book that morgan referenced about boys don't cry we said yes to that book because we were troubling over the same questions and so when jules and i started having these conversations i realized very quickly that Jules might be just that. And you know, we've never actually used that language. Take my hand and let's walk together. I think that gesture Jules embodies as a teacher, as a public intellectual, as an interlocutor, as a friend. And 
the amount of work it does that I think for the project that allows Jen and Barbara to sit as Jen and Barbara and to not say, take my hand, right? We don't need Jen to hold your hand. We get to actually occupy different spaces and different affects for different reasons throughout the film. And it's Jules to whom we continue to return and attach. And it's also through Jules that you're able to better interrogate and see me and Kristen and Morgan and some of the other sort of authorial apparatus of the film because of that extension. I really like that gesture. I think it's something we can use and, and keep thinking about together. I love that. Um... Morgan, uh, I want to start with you for this question. You know, as much as movies grow and change over time, and it's been explicitly stated that this movie did indeed grow and change over time and take different shapes through the collaborative process, we tend to change with the creation of art or movies, whatever you want to call it. How were you able to grow throughout the course of making this movie? Oh my God, what a question. Um... <laughs> I feel like I have learned so much as an artist and as a collaborator from working on this project and particularly working so closely with Chase. Like I feel, um, you know, I'm a quadruple Capricorn. She loves to do things by herself, a lot of 12th house placements. Um, and so, uh, moving into uh, what I frequently refer to as Chase's friendship bracelet approach to life has completely changed the way that I think about making art and culture. Um, and thankfully, the like ease of this project, which has not always been the case in collaborations I've had in the past, um, has really... Um, reframed how I think about producing work going forward. And now, in fact, most of the work that I'm producing, uh, both with Chase and with other people, is highly collaborative. So I'd say my entire approach to making art and culture um, has kind of fundamentally shifted from this project in a way that's really exciting to me. That's incredible to hear. And I love the the term you use, a friendship bracelet approach to to making art. Um, I, I feel that very much, and, I, and I'm definitely going to use that term from here on out. I love that. Um, Jen, how about you? Uh, you know, I feel like we grow from every project that we make, and, and you've had the good fortune to be a part of a lot. How did portraying Barbara change you? You, you know, if I'm really honest, there was something personal going on with me at the same time of filming that kind of overshadows like what happened, like it was kind of the context around it, but also reflective of the community and that I was in the middle of a first date uh, during the filming of Frame and Agnes and like came uh, to set talking to, to Chase and everyone uh, about uh, the date and that person is now my wife <laughs> so <laughs> that was that's really like it's forever kind of like wrapped into that uh for me uh and I'd love to think that a little bit of Barbara's confidence compounded with the the kind of confidence that comes for me when I'm working that 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 probably in some way imbued um that first date uh which is that's where i'm least confident in the world <laughs> is is in love and romance uh and, and so i think barbara and just working with all these amazing people kind of made me feel a little bit more uh together and powerful and and uh yeah led to <laughs> the love of my life so <laughs> wow i'm extremely sentimental so you got me almost crying over here um, <laughs> uh jules how about you how did this process you know help change you Gosh, yeah. I mean, I feel like it's been totally life changing. I mean, and part of it is is I think I'm also a Capricorn. I'm also a solitary worker. I'm a perfectionist. I push myself really hard, and you know, I think like lots of people, I've responded to the inadequacies of of the environment in which I've been forced to live by overcompensating and you know trying to move mountains. Um, you know, instead of well, actually trying to move mountains in recognition of of the injustices of things that were never given to me, things that I can't change, things that I can't, you know, alter about my past. But um, so for me to come into 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 a team 
um, and to actually feel something that I certainly, you know, felt at, in earlier moments, but I'll tell you like the moment I walked on set the first morning and I was so nervous because I was the only person on the call sheet for the day. I was like, okay, well, I, I mean, I hope this was all a good idea because here we are, we had all moved mountains to be there during COVID. And, you know, I was like, well, gosh, I really hope we're taking the right gamble on me. But the moment that I walked on set, like something just switched because I felt this profound sense of support and trust. Right. And, and trust as in, you know, of course, something earned, but something very alive and responsive. And it just had this dramatic effect on me. Um, I, I feel like I have been benefiting from that experience, like in every corner of my life since then. And uh, I guess I, I guess I sort of relate to that sense of confidence that you were talking about, Jen, like for me too, actually, when I'm in the hot seat, when I'm doing my job is often when I feel the most self actualized, the most confident, I don't get nervous doing that. But but there was something about actually the experience of taking myself so seriously as to be able to sit down in that chair on set and just hold court, right? And try and offer something that I thought would be strong and robust enough to meet all of the other people in this film and in this project and be able to, you know, thread this film together. And that that worked has just like completely changed, I think, my relationship to my own kind of professional and creative um, work. So, you know, I just feel sort of forever grateful and, and to be a part of something that feels you know, not just important in the sense of precedent making or um, bringing to light something that people should know, but actually is like moving the world forward, right? And I think that, you know, especially in, in all of the very many horrible things that we all face collectively and personally right now, to feel like you're a part of something that's like shifting the terms, rewriting rule books, making future work even more possible than it was. I mean, I just can't think of anything that's more gratifying than that. So, you know, to, to be able to be a part of that is something that, you know, it just gets me excited. It makes me want to pay back my gratitude by, by being a part of whatever's to come next. Lastly, Chase, you've been living with this project for years through multiple iterations. How has this entire process changed you? Well, maybe one of the ways to, to answer that is to further elaborate this notion of the friendship bracelet approach to the project, um, which is something that our editor and co-producer, Brooke Siebold, had offered up when we were thick in many strands of narrative potential, trying to wrestle with the ways in which we might overlap and interlace to produce something that would then appear to be whole. And if we want to just spend a little bit more time, I will say that there are many choices you can make when making a friendship bracelet that cause your friendship bracelet to be very strange looking and dare I say ugly. And so it's a real commitment to trying to unknot and rethread in a variety of different ways. And, you know, I'm speaking about Brooke here, our producing team, my dear friend, Kristen Schilt, who I started this project with back in 2014, who remains a part of our team today. These are all long-standing, deeply invested friendships that anchor and inform how we're able to take these risks together. And so for all the ways in which we've said collaboration is, is the future, I think friendship is also the future and a real commitment to each other on screen and off and a willingness to keep showing up and to recognize that our film is an object that's gonna move around the world, but our relationships will extend far beyond the, the scope of this project. And that for me is always going to be the most exciting and the most important. Amen, you are speaking my language. Uh, <laughs> I love that. Um, you know, just to, to, to ask one final question, uh, you know, I, I asked everybody ahead of time, you know, are, are there any questions you're sick of yet? You're in the midst of press uh, for a major, major film festival premiere. Um, and Chase suggested that Jules, I ask you uh, a lasting question. Um, what do you hope people take away after watching Framing Agnes? So I don't know if he set me up for failure here, or if there's a, a, a answer I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be blown away by. <laughs> no, Sab, you should just settle back in your seat and get ready. Right. This, is, this is an extraordinary moment. You want me to crack my knuckles before I get going? <laughs> no, you I mean, you know, it's, it's, and I do get like that. The more I talk about something, the more forceful I get about it. But I just really think that this is a film that, you know, 
it's not just swooping in, we're building on so much momentum. And I think all of the people involved in it have been and continue to be and will continue to be major players in how we tell trans stories in our culture. And so, you know, something happens when you assemble an incredible dream team like that. But I really think that Framing Agnes comes in and says like, time's up to cis culture, time's up to mainstream culture, we're done with tired, easy, digestible narratives about trans people where we're either victims and in, in, of tragic circumstances or impossible perfect saints who never could have really lived and it comes in and it says where does life really take place right and it comes in and says we've been framed in one way our entire lives as people who are deceptive or untruthful yeah but the whole thing the whole edifice the whole story is the lie and life itself takes place somewhere in between truth and a lie and so i think this film is sort of swooping in to say like we're tired of being spoon-fed simple narratives. We're tired of things being sort of recycled. We're tired of the same old tropes and stereotypes of trans people. And we're ready to take the reins, right? Like, look what happens when you don't just put us in front of the camera, but put us behind the camera, right? And create a dialogue between those two places. And I think that there's just something, you know, there's this kind of trans sensibility about the project that's just coming in and is like, all right, you know what? We're gonna we're going to be nice. We're going to, you know, be gentle because like we've got a lot of expertise. We're pretty, you know, we're pretty pent up. Um, you know, we come from a place of like knowing too much because of circumstance. And so like, come with us a little bit, let us show you a little bit of magic and then let's give you some homework, right? I really think the audience is going to be implicated in this film. I think the audience will become part of the film. I think there's no way to refuse that. And I think that is a damn good thing in 2022. I just think we're so ready. Like this is a film that I think like a lot of trans projects is so severely overdue. And part of that, of course, has to do with institutional barriers. But part of that is just that our histories have been suppressed and we have been kept out of jobs and we have been kept out of places like this. We have been on screen, but we have never been in control of what we're saying. And so I think in some ways, Framing Agnes is a real meditation on the sheer power when you give trans people collaborative creative control, we can do things the likes of which no one has ever seen before. And I just think that's something that, you know, it gets me up in the morning three years into a pandemic. So I'm excited to share that with the world. But, you know, I, I really do hope that people walk, walk away from the film feeling a little unnerved in the best possible way. Like, you know what? I do need to do a little bit better in how I think about this. I do need to be more thoughtful, more considerate, or I do need to do a little learning, um, you know, to live in the world more, more affirmatively and harmoniously with the rest of us. So, I mean, those are some of the things that I hope, but, I, you know, again, it's, it's, it's nothing, nothing that I'm saying isn't something that I think has been said by every single person on this panel and every single person in this film, both explicitly and through their performances. It, I, I keep saying this, but like, this is a film you're going to want to watch three, four, five times in a row because, every, and it's not because it's too complicated, it's because every single layer of it is so valuable. And every time you sit with it, I just think it keeps giving and giving in ways that are, that are truly kind of magical. So knuckles unclenched, uncracked. <laughs> Beautiful answer. Well done. Uh, that is just the right, um, that is just the right inspiration I needed to, to watch this movie again this weekend at the Sundance Film Festival, just in time for your premiere. Um, congratulations to all of you. I hope you're able to enjoy this moment and all of the, the buzz that comes with a big premiere like this. Um, before we go, I'd love to go around one more time. Uh, where can people find you online if you want them to find you online? And how can they support the film? Jen? Oh, uh, online everywhere. I'm smart ass Jen. Very easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can find me on Twitter at Morgan M. Page. Um, I'm just generally around. I'm also around at GP underscore JLS on Twitter, and I write every so often um, on a substack called Sad Brown Girl as well. And I am okay. Googleable at Chase Joint in all places. And how Excellent. can they support the film, Chase? 
Pardon me. How can people support the film? Oh my goodness. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Framingagnes.com, newly designed by our extraordinary producer, Samantha Curley. You can follow us and the momentums of various screenings. And I honestly think following engaging our extraordinary participants is the way in which to support the film. Thanks for the reprompt. Excellent. Um, well, I just want to thank everybody for watching our conversation with the creative minds behind Framing Agnes. Once again, we want to thank Mama Film for sharing their platform with us and to the Sundance Film Festival for making this all possible. Uh, if you want to support the Transgender Film Center, you can follow us at Trans Film Center on Instagram and Twitter or by making a donation at transfilmcenter.org. Finally, like we already talked about, please buy a ticket to watch Framing Agnes at Sundance 2022. You can follow the movie on Instagram and Twitter at Framing Agnes and sign up for their mailing list at framingagnes.com. Thank you so much and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.